Thank you, Mr. Kimura, for your excellent moderation and for all speakers for sharing their expertise. Now, allow me to continue to the second panel session on how to secure affordable energy transition pathways, which will be moderated by Dr. Yan Feili, Research Fellow of IRIA. Dr. Yan Feili, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, so, can you see my uh, slides? Yes. From there? Okay. That's great. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure of mine to uh, be part of this great event. And uh, I'm Yan Feili, a research fellow from IRIA. Um, the session that uh, I am uh, handling uh, as a moderator uh, is titled How to Secure affordable energy transition pathways. Now this is uh, directly related to the previous uh, discussions. And uh, I think we have heard a lot from the scholars, researchers, um, and also industrial experts um, on energy transition issues. Now, uh, this session, I think is a great opportunity for us to hear from senior officers and also uh, their policymakers. Um, so uh, in this session, uh, we will have uh, three distinguished uh, speakers. Um, the first one is uh, Dr. Pumpat uh, Lison Bapipong, uh, Chief of the International Energy Corporation of the Ministry of Energy, Thailand. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Dr. Saleh Abdurrahman, uh, he is a member of Committee for Downstream Oil and Gas Regulatory Body, uh, the former Senior Advisor for Environment and Spatial Planning of the uh, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources from Indonesia. And last but not least, we have uh, His Excellency Dr. Victor Jonah. He is the Under Secretary of State of the Ministry of Mines and uh, energy from Cambodia. Now, um, uh, first of all, please allow me to say a few things to uh, set the scene and also um, to uh, focus on a few uh, questions, uh, specific questions um, that I would like to raise to the panelists. Uh, firstly, I think uh, we recall the previous uh, presentations. Uh, the gas price is already highlighted. What I want to add here is that um, the gas prices in Asia is closely following uh, the developments in the global markets, especially the European markets, uh, so that uh, we all now have to suffer uh, higher natural gases, uh, natural gas prices, um, in the sense that it's about uh, four to five times uh, than the previous uh, uh, normal gas prices. So this uh, has set us uh, great challenges uh, this year, especially the coming winter. Uh, how, how do we uh, handle this? Um, well, uh, in the sense of medium to long term, uh, I think the answer uh, is renewables. Uh, so now looking at the renewables, it's uh, developing fast. However, uh, if you look at the uh, developing world, uh, especially if we look at the ASEAN, uh, this development, if you look at the left-hand side of the figure, um, the four uh, leading players, uh, we do not, among the four leading players, we do not see ASEAN there. So this means that this region uh, may have to uh, do a lot to accelerate the development in this regard. Uh, this is not only a, a response to a climate change costs, but also a response to uh, the imminent uh, global energy uh, situation. Uh, as I mentioned, the hiking fossil prices. And uh, if you look at the right-hand side of the figure, uh, you can see that the shares of these renewables um, in our total energy supply uh, is still limited so that uh, we still have a long way to go. 
Now behind uh, this, uh, the drivers, uh, the key, one of the key drivers, I think, is the cost of these renewables. Um, if we look at these uh, numbers from IRENA, it's really encouraging because we are seeing that the costs are falling, especially if you look at the levelized cost of electricity, uh, uh, like uh, uh, wind and uh, solar, they are actually reaching or going below the uh, what we call grid parity uh, compared to fossil fuel electricity. So that um, uh, this is really encouraging, but uh, this is not all of the story. If you are familiar with the power sector, actually we have another layer of problem that is the intermittency and unpredictability of the renewables. So that uh, this need to this development uh, need to actually go in hand uh, in hand uh, with the uh, development of energy storage. So that's another layer of challenge, the costs of energy storage, especially uh, in, uh, to, to be developed in tandem with uh, renewables. Uh, we have uh, many options. However, uh, these options are not so, uh, so to speak, uh, cost competitive yet. Uh, if you look at the hydrogen, uh, this is based on my own study, uh, they're in the range of 40, some 40 to uh, 80 cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, if we're talking about using uh, green hydrogen as the storage means, and uh, um, the differences among the different pathways of hydrogen is due to the uh, different uh, transportation and storage technologies we have chosen for hydrogen. And if this is compared with a uh, lithium battery and pumped hydro, uh, uh, they are uh, also expensive, but the better than the hydrogen, they are in the range of uh, some something around 20 cent per kilowatt hour. So that's battery and pump hydro. Uh, this having said that, this means that uh, I think we have some dilemmas uh, that mm. is faced by uh, stakeholders, especially policymakers. Uh, it's about what technologies to choose and when to deploy them and also uh, how to uh, do that. Um, so uh, this uh, kind of a background uh, has brought me uh, to these four specific questions uh, that I would like to take this opportunity and raise to our uh, distinguished guests, the policymakers, uh, for their um, insights um, on these issues. Uh, first one, uh, from your country perspective, what are the affordable and feasible uh, options uh, to your country? Uh, there is a list here, but uh, maybe not list, uh, not limited to this list, like uh, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, and nuclear and BEV and hydrogen, et cetera. And uh, secondly, uh, I think very important to, from Asham perspective is that uh, we should not only perceive uh, uh, the tra energy transition as a kind of an obligation for Asham, but also opportunities for Asham, opportunities to develop new industrial sectors. Uh, for example, the equipment manufacturing, um, the uh, operation of the new type of uh, uh, energy plants and also the uh, maintenance and the services and so on. Uh, and especially as part of the future uh, global supply chain for these technologies. So what do you perceive as the opportunities for your country uh, in this perspective? And certainly uh, international cooperation, collaboration would be very important. Uh, this is, is uh, reminded by uh, other uh, streams of research of myself, uh, especially like uh, Ashan Power Grid and also the Ashan uh, Natural Gas uh, Network. So uh, to what extent uh, do you think these international efforts, uh, international collaboration efforts would help Ashan's uh, energy uh, transition? And uh, lastly, uh, this is uh, uh, to some extent covered by the previous session. Uh, I also want to raise the issue about the Ukraine situation. Uh, what has been changed 
uh, to the energy transition uh, plan of your country uh, from that event. And uh, uh, also uh, zooming that down to a more specific question is uh, more uh, realistic question is, uh, has that uh, influenced the plan of the country uh, for the shift from coal to gas? So I think uh, uh, that's all from my uh, from my side uh, to set the scene. Now it's time for us to enjoy uh, the uh, insightful uh, knowledge and ideas from our senior uh, and distinguished uh, panelists. So uh, without further ado, may I now uh, invite Dr. Saleh uh, Abdul Rahman to share your points. Dr. Saleh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Yanfei. Uh, it's very good introduction from, from you on the situation that we have. Uh, on the region. Uh, but first, I think I would like to uh, thank and appreciate the government of Cambodia and area for hosting this uh, important meeting. I think the topic is very timely uh, as we experience, uh, if I may say, a new dynamics of global energy supply uh, following the Russia and Ukraine war. Uh, as we see some countries in Europe is looking back at the fossil fuels whether it's, this is for short time or longer time, we don't know yet. Uh, however, this war, uh, this war and its impact on global and the dynamics shows that uh, domestic and security is the utmost interest for all countries. Uh, I would also like to appreciate uh, and get some points from uh, Prof. Arima's presentation that the, the ASEAN uh, carbon neutrality option uh, may not be the same as uh, other countries, other region in, 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 the, in, 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 in the world. We see that the IEG and area studies understand uh, the ASEAN or the regional circumstances of the region. Uh, and, and I think uh, come up with some option on early uh, partial and deep decarbonization. Uh, Panuki also presented uh, the ASEAN condition and good if we have an ASEAN way of of the cup uh, pathway. I think that's what I my my impression from previous speakers. Also, thanks to uh, industrial speakers that we just heard the many good information from IA, from uh, Keplers and others. Uh, thank you for that uh, very meaningful information. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for Indonesia, the impact of the Ukrainian war uh, is is huge in terms of the uh, because of the oil price increase. Uh, as we import considerable amount of crude and products, uh, and that the fact that we still subsidize uh, gasoline and diesels as well as the LPG and electricity, uh, the impact was significant on the increase of subsidy. Uh, with the current price of uh, crude oil, if I may uh, inform that the, the subsidy was up to three times when compared to our initial budget allocation in 2022. This policy, uh, uh, the subsidy is given uh, is to keep the good economic growth uh, uh, post pandemic and also considering uh, the, the power purchasing capability of our people who just recovered from the pandemic. Uh, however, we also believe that we also see that this is not sustainable and uh, we now uh, preparing a measures to, to take to allocate the subsidy to those really deserve. Uh, now we go to my first slide. I have only two slides here. Uh, my first slide, please. Uh, I mean, uh, um, next slide. This uh, one slide shows the uh, the Indonesia energy transition roadmap. If you see from uh, this slide, I put all information in one slide because of the time concern. <clears throat> you see here that uh, in line with previous speakers that uh, what is we prioritize on our energy transition roadmap uh, in the next five years? So I'm, I'm concentrating on, on, on short-term uh, outlook, a short-term uh, roadmap. You see here that, uh, that we rely much on the biomass, actually. So the, the roadmap is, fo uh, is fo focusing on the optimization of renewable. But the use of coal, gas, and fuel are still crucial to meet the growing 
uh, energy demand, uh, you know, post the pandemic. So between 2022 and 2030, uh, as you see from this slide that we focus to develop coal co wiring actually and small scale biomass power plant because we see that this is the most available and reducing our uh, import, I mean our uh, 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 dependence on import as well as for the, for the transportation uh, sectors. Uh, we also developed the, the uh, biodiesels uh, B30 and then uh, B40. So that is uh, the main uh, action we take uh, for the short time, uh, given the fact the, the, the uh, unstable uh, dynamics or turbulent situation of the global uh, energy supply and demand uh, very recently, as also our speakers from I mentioned that we don't know yet. Uh, what is the trend of the of the current uh, 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 supply shortage in Europe due to the war? So I think uh, some other uh, option that we prioritize uh, in the next five years, if if you see from here, that we will develop the city gas, the city gas uh, uh, to replace the LPG. You know that we almost imported like seventy to eighty percent LPG for our household. Uh, uh, cookings. So we will uh, um, optimize the use of city gas uh, to more than 5 million households in 2025 to 2030. Also, we now on the uh, final study to uh, replace the LPG to uh, demethyl ether to DME and also promotion of induction of electric cookers for more than 8 million households uh, during the period uh, from 20. 22 to 2025 and 2030. And also we, as, as in many other countries, that we also promote the use of electric vehicles. Um, and as you, as you know that uh, the public transport is now becoming, uh, uh, having more discussion in our country, uh, given the fact that uh, the, 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 uh, the increase of oil price. And all of the numbers of the city gas of the uh, of the uh, electric vehicles, of the uh, uh, like uh, induction electric uh, cookers will be will will continue to increase uh, by time to meet our uh, net zero emission target by twenty sixty. Uh, uh, others, uh, you know, option we follow all the the global trend on hydrogen. If you see here, there also on the CCS, especially for the industrial use. Uh, and also like ocean, we, we see that we, we open for all uh, types of energy to meet uh, the uh, net zero emission target by 2060. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is very important, uh, in my opinion, we discuss because I always talk about this because uh, whatever uh, energy policy roadmap we make, if we don't have any investment, it will be just, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say, just on paper. So investment is very important. If you say here that how much we need for the investment requirement, just on electricity sectors, both on uh, transmission and generation, uh, to meet the, the 2060 uh, net zero emission target, the total investment uh, we need, uh, you know, mostly to develop the RE uh, and also in per, um, uh, transmission will be around 28 billion US dollar per year to 2060. Of course, this is very big, huge amount and we cannot afford to, uh, you know, finance by ourselves. We have very limited uh, state budget uh, on annual basis. This, is, this in investment will include, uh, you know, like hydrogen, ocean energy, carbon capture and storage, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, geothermal, uh, hydro and solars and, and other types of renewable uh, energy. So I think uh, given the huge amount of investment needed, uh, all the net zero emission target can be met with international support. This is very important. Uh, we believe that uh, we share the same requirement with other developing countries uh, so that all international instruments for financial support must be created, in my opinion, 
with special condition, including low interest and long tenures. We expect some real financial support in any types of renewable energy. And for, especially for Indonesia, that given our big market and our strategic position in the region, uh, we also invite energy and industrial investors to invest on renewable energy technology, uh, electric vehicles, uh, energy efficient products, uh, and also carbon captures uh, and storage. Um, on the integration of ASEAN energy market, as Dr. Yante mentioned on the question, uh, on the list of question uh, he presented, uh, I would say that uh, it will certainly help us to strengthen and accelerate uh, our energy transition. Uh, since some of our, our uh, ASEAN countries uh, have considerable potential for renewable energy and also for, for instance, as uh, in the case of Indonesia as a CCS hub. However, again, uh, we need to secure that the investment that coming to this region is big to meet our energy transition goal. That's what I can share on this opportunity, uh, Dr. Yanpi. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saleh. I'm very impressed by this uh, presentation on the Indonesia's uh, opinions and also your vision. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's very impressive that you have such a big plan for solar, uh, uh, several hundred gigawatt of uh, development in the coming decades. Yeah, and also nuclear, <laughs> um, some 61 uh, gigawatt. That's very ambitious. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saleh. Um, so next, uh, may I uh, invite Dr. Pumpat? Uh, Dr. Pumpat, are you already? Uh, online? Yeah, I see you online. Are you uh, ready to make the presentation? So uh, I've heard that uh, Dr. Pumpat may be uh, running on some delays due to urgent uh, government matters uh, on his side. So uh, perhaps at this point, uh, I move on to our uh, third speaker. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Excellency uh, Dr. Victor Jona, would you like to share with us your knowledge and uh, ideas, Dr. Jona? Thank you very much. Professor Nisi Murasan, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Moderator, all the speakers in the session number two, a very good morning. Energy transition is a long way to go. Last year in 2021, all ASEAN member states have endorsed the Declaration on Energy Security and Energy Transition. Cambodia is a party of the United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change and the International Environmental Treaty. We would like to inform you that the recent year, in 2022, Cambodia has a primary energy supply consisting of 60% combined with fossil fuel, coal and oil, and the remaining 40% combined of renewable energy such as hydropower, solar and biomass. In terms of power generation mix, Cambodia has about 42% share of coal and the remaining 58% share of renewable energy, including hydropower, solar, and biomass. Thus, at present situation, Cambodia has already contributed a very high share of renewable energy in the primary energy supply as well as in the power generation mix. Moving toward, Cambodian will see the importance of using clean fossil fuel as a gradual, gradually introdu introduce of clean technology and renewable energy into the entire energy system. However, toward the purely renewable energy is very unlikely without consideration of the current fossil fuel, fuel based on energy system and we will make carefully plan on what is 
the mid-term and long-term energy planning of Cambodia. I hope other countries may also encounter the same situation in Cambodia. Natural gas industry is expected to grow due to the increase of future demand in ASEAN and East Asia during the energy transition as gas play a vital role to reduce emission compared to coal. Thus, we need to find way on how to use both oil and gas and coal. Sustainability in the meeting of the objective of providing energy services, improving the quality of life, and boosting the economic growth. As and ladies and gentlemen, taking this opportunity, we would like to express our sincere thanks to METI of Japan for providing the technical assistance to Cambodia via Japan International Cooperation Agency, JICA, to formulate the de development of clean energy transition roadmap toward the carbon neutrality society in Cambodia. And the project is started April 2022 and will be ended by March 2024. I believe that with the international and regional energy cooperation, such as making the region of ASEAN be well connected with ASEAN power market, increasing the value chain of power production and technology transfer are a key for the region to achieve the technology innovation and reduce the overall cost of decarbonization. And we would like to inform to everyone that uh, we, the te we got technical assistance from ASEAN Development Bank to prepare the roadmap for PDP from Power Development Plan from 2021 up to 2040. And the study is almost completed, and uh, we saw in the picture by 2040, the power generation mix will be mix of uh, hydropower, LNG, and coal still used for power generation as uh, uh, it is um, reliable, and another thing is uh, it is economy. Anyway, country in ASEAN is on the way for energy transition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonah. Very uh, impressive uh, introduction on the situation in Cambodia. Um, I learned a lot, uh, especially that uh, um, coal and gas both are still expected to play important role uh, on the way of uh, Cambodia's energy transition, fully understand. And also, I uh, strongly uh, agree with your call for the international collaboration on the technology transfer and value chain collaboration for clean energy. It's uh, really uh, very uh, impulsive, I think, for uh, countries around the world to work together with ASEAN countries, especially the developing ones. Uh, to strengthen international uh, collaboration in this regard. Uh, next, without further ado, uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Pumpat to uh, deliver your presentation. Dr. Pumpat, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Li Yanfei, and uh, good afternoon, uh, His Excellency Victor Jonah and Dr. Shale. Uh, it's my honor to join this uh, forum today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, IRIA and Ministry of uh, Mine and Energy of Cambodia for hosting this important event. And I think that the topic that we are discussing and, and sharing today is quite opportune and also uh, uh, very timely matters that we have to address uh, this uh, topic. And especially it just uh, right before the, the uh, AMEM meeting. So I think that the deliver the discussion today will be able to uh, deliver to our uh, ministers. 
Uh, first of all, I, I would like to share with you some slides because I, I, um, I prepared some slides to, to, to address my, my issues. Um, but I will not do all the slides, but I will select only some slides. So maybe I think the first picture that we are now uh, very uh, sure that the global warming is now threatening us. Uh, maybe go to the second slide, please. And the the global warming is now threatening us, and and the effort to uh, strive for the uh, carbon neutrality is very mandatory to to every country right now. And um, I'm lucky that we faced the COVID-19 uh, uh, in the past two years, and also the uh, geopolitical situation is also aggravate the, the, the situation on, on how to get the economic recovery after that. So I think that at this point in time, um, most countries are now facing the, the uh, supply shortage and also the high energy costs, and that also leads to the, the high inflation as well. So the efforts that we are going to move, move on to the decarbonization pathway is still uh, uh, getting some uh, uh, unsmooth path, but I think that this effort is still uh, ongoing. But how can the, the question, the key question is how can we address this, uh, 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 this uh, efforts and how can we unite our efforts in this region together? This is the, the key things that, that we need to, to address. Next, please. I think that uh, I would like to show you quickly that the greenhouse gas uh, situation in Thailand that we are now facing is that we we have the uh, CO two emission around two hundred forty seven million tons in the in the past year, and if we take into account the uh, carbon emission, mostly come from the power generation and transportation. So all these two, uh, when they add up together, is more than 60%. And that means we need to address the uh, uh, carbon emission in the power generation and transportation really quickly. This is the, the key things. Next, please. The next uh, slides I would like to show you quickly that Thailand is now still rely on the, the fossil fuels for our uh, energy consumption, oil product, Natural gas and coal, you can see that it's altogether more than 88%. And that means uh, when we want to do the uh, energy transition to shift from, non -fossil, from fossil to non-fossil fuels, uh, that also needs a lot of efforts and a lot of the uh, finance uh, in, in doing that too. Next, please. In terms of the power generation, we... Uh, have been experienced for a long time that in the past we rely a lot on the natural gas, uh, more than 70%. Uh, and if we try to lower this uh, portion from time to time. And right now we have the natural gas for our power generation mix by 55%, but we still need to import more of the coal and, and, the, and also our lignite uh, that is, is for a power generation by 16%. Our import uh, hydropower is also around 15%. And our renewable energy that we got promotion more than a decade is now taking into account around 11%. Next, please. It's clear that our ambition to go to net uh, zero carbon emission by 2050 and net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2065. This is the key things that our prime minister has been uh, committed to uh, the world during the COP26 last year. And that has been translated to our uh, key policy in four areas. Next, please. In our four areas, we want to transform First is our transportation sector by promoting the electric vehicle. We call it the policy 30 at 30. That means by the year 2030, uh, the production of the electric vehicle will be around 30% in our market. And we want to increase our renewable energy proportion 
in the new power generation by 50% within the year 2040. And we want to increase our energy efficiency by more than 40%. And this is also have to uh, use the energy transition uh, strategy that we call for the uh, consisting of digitalization, decarbonization, decentralization, and deregulation. So these are key things that we want to follow. Next, please. In terms of the uh, infrastructure, I think the if the energy cost uh, to deliver from from the source of the production to the to the demand uh, to the buyers, uh, the key thing to lower this cost, we must uh, try to make sure that our infrastructure are put in place. And this must be very efficient in terms of the cost effectiveness. So uh, the government of Thailand trying to promote the grid modernization. Uh, that means we have to install uh, the key things on our data management architects, the uh, battery energy storage and the grid infrastructure. These kinds of, of things will help us to uh, lower the cost and can uh, manage the energy uh, transferring uh, 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 efficiently as well. Next, please. In terms of the uh, portfolio for the future renewable energy, we focus various kinds of the, the um, uh, alternative energy, but I would like to uh, show you that for the solar energy, we still have plenty of rooms for our promotion by at least uh, 9,200 uh, megawatts that we are still uh, uh, need to push more on this. And Thailand is the agricultural countries, uh, biomass and biogas is uh, something that is much for us to, to promote. And for the waste, in terms of the municipal waste, uh, we still have more rooms to promote it by at least uh, 400 megawatts. Uh, for the floating solar as well, uh, we have a lot of, next please, we have a lot of the uh, uh, reservoirs, uh, nine dams across the countries, and we want to make use the uh, reservoirs around the country uh, efficiently. We plan to install the floating solar by at least 2,700 megawatts more. Next please. Because Thailand already concerned that the uh, this uh, the the system integration of our energy uh, system must not be separated, uh, we have to combine our uh, bio. Uh, that means the agricultural sector uh, to make use of that uh, uh, produce and also the the waste from from that uh, uh, agricultural sectors to produce energy. And also we are trying to uh, make sure that the waste and every unused uh, products will be uh, uh, efficiently used and then it can generate more uh, power and more electricity. And that has been put into the uh, infrastructure to make sure that the uh, green society will be achievable. And this, what we expect to see is uh, a better well-being and also uh, higher energy security and can lower the carbon emission as well. That is the concept we call the BCG, which is the, the concept that we are trying to promote during uh, this year uh, uh, when Thailand is the chair of the APEC Leader Summit in this November as well. Uh, next, please. I would like, I think this uh, slide is also uh, similar to what I present before the smart energy that is trying to equip with the uh, uh, digitalized system that trying to govern our infrastructure. Next, please. So come to the, 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 the key questions that you have addressed at the beginning of this session that how can we secure our energy uh, uh, transition? I think that uh, if I can put in a nutshell, there are two keywords. The first thing, we need to make sure that our people can access to the energy. And also that energy must be affordable for them as well. 
if we can put this uh, uh, into the agenda of the policy makers, by all means, that will ensure our sustainable energy future. This is the, the recap of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pumpet for your very comprehensive introduction on the Thailand's uh, visions and uh, ideas. Uh, I really like this uh, 4D strategy. It's very comprehensive and uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it represents a very advanced way of, uh, a systematic way of thinking about uh, how to develop the future oriented uh, energy system uh, in Thailand. Um, and also, uh, uh, Thailand has very ambitious uh, plan for the deployment of uh, EVs uh, and uh, uh, smart uh, grid, these kind of uh, new technologies. Um, so uh, all, all this very encouraging. And uh, uh, after hearing uh, three speakers, uh, I couldn't help but come to a, a key question, especially from the government's point of view. As Dr. Pumpat, you mentioned about affordability. Uh, I'm thinking about the two layers of affordability. One is the affordability of this future energy to people. And the second is the affordability to government. As Dr. Saleh also mentioned about the subsidies issue that you're currently facing like already three times higher uh, subsidies issue. I, I'm sure this will be more because if we're doing uh, really doing this aggressive energy transition, uh, a lot of more subsidies will need to come from uh, government to incentivize uh, private sectors and also uh, incentivize household to use the new energy. So uh, what are the your perspective on uh, this issue, these two affordability issues? Um, Maybe uh, I go around the, all the three speakers on this. Uh, maybe immediately from uh, Dr. Pumpat. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for, for your questions. Uh, in terms of the affordability, the, the, the first level that you have mentioned that how can we deliver the future energy to people? I think at this point in time, uh, uh, for the future energy, we can consider the clean energy as the, the uh, future energy for them. So I think at this point in time, the, um, uh, most of the, the people in Thailand right now, they are trying to uh, uh, lower the cost of the energy in their households by trying to equip their home with the, the solar rooftop and also uh, make sure that they can lower the cost of the, the uh, uh, electricity uh, uh, monthly. Uh, but another uh, excess supply of the, the solar rooftop can be, or it can be sold back to the grid as well. This is the, the, um, uh, the policy that uh, the government trying to, to promote at this time. But of course, uh, to, to equip with the solar rooftop, uh, technologies, uh, uh, the cost of, of equipping th th this kind of, of uh, equipment uh, must be uh, getting lower. Uh, otherwise, it cannot be widespread to, to uh, all households in the, in the countries. So I think we come to, to, to the questions that if the solar uh, rooftop must be promoted, we must ensure how can we uh, uh, produce and lower the cost of, of the solar rooftop. And also in terms of uh, when we equip this uh, solar rooftop, it can help uh, uh, increase the, the employment in, in the country as well. For, for the questions about the government subsidy, I think that this is the, uh, um, I think every country is now facing and, and they are they're knowing that the, uh, without the, the subsidy to, mm -hmm. to the uh, conventional uh, energy, I think the, the family uh, will be uh, very uh, suffering on at this time. So Thailand is now uh, trying to make sure that the subsidy will be targeted to only the, the household that is suffering, really suffering. We, we don't want to, to subsidi subsidize across the board. We must make sure that the, the, the uh, for example, like the street uh, food vendor, and, uh, and the low income group uh, family, they can get some uh, subsidy for, for the electric cities and, and for free and also for the, uh, even the uh, motorcycle. 
uh, motorcycle, uh, uh, they also get some subsidy for, for the program as well. And even the LPG, we, we, we have to uh, uh, subsidize uh, at this point in time. And, and also uh, the diesel oils that uh, have been used widely across the country. <laughs> this is something that we, we need to, to get some subsidy. And we hope that this uh, situation will not prolong. Otherwise, it will, will also uh, affect the, the, the government uh, budget uh, uh, condition as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pumpat. Uh, Dr. Saleh, would you like to? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yanpe. I think, uh, in my opinion, that uh, all the, the roadmap, the net zero roadmap, has to also impacting the economic growth in each country. Okay, so when we plan to develop so many capacities in electricity sector, for instance, it has also the benefit of increasing the local economy. So when the local economy grows, then they will have a better affordability. Okay, so we just not, uh, uh, you know, constructing new generation of renewable without any you know, relationship with the, with the local economy growth. This is very important, I think, for us in ASEAN countries. Meaning that we have to make, produce the energy infrastructures in-house. That's my point. Secondly, for us in ASEAN countries, given our circumstances at this time, uh, we need to prioritize what types of uh, energy source, uh, for instance, in the electricity sector, that affordable for us. If we say, if my, if our state-owned company like PLN or our IPPs built like hydrogen, at this time, is not affordable for our local people to pay. So the pri the pri prioritization has to see. Uh, that's why I agree with uh, Professor. Arima uh, opinion and IEG or area opinion that we have to develop uh, our uh, our energy transition roadmap based on our local circumstances, based on the uh, the early, the partial, and the deep decarbonization uh, scenario. So I fully agree with that. In our case, like I mentioned before, that we see that the co-firing, the biomass, small scale or medium scale, and also, of course, for the solar, solar fee is now booming. But I also impressed with Dr. Nuki's information that one country, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, has all the market. We should not do that. I mean, we should develop our, uh, you know, the same technology here in ASEAN countries so that we can have the the our net zero emission target, all the roadmaps, it's also related to the local economy development. That's what I can say, uh, Dr. Yanfei, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saleh, for the very insightful comment. Uh, Dr. Jonah, would you like to share with us your views on this question? Thank you very much, moderators. Regarding the affordable for the people, we would like to inform you that uh, in the whole Cambodian, we have 14,168 villages. To now, we provide access to the village up to 13,860 villages. It means that 97.6% of the village already provide access of electricity to the people. We still remain around 300 <coughs> villages that have not access to electricity. For this, the government have, because the, the, the reason that we could not expand for the other 300 villages because that village is in the island areas and in the another is in the very remote area that the grid could not expand and some village, they have no road to access. So in this case, because the policy of the government, we have to provide power to all the people in throughout Cambodia. So in this case, 
the 300 villages uh, with the support of, com uh, of the ministry and EDC, the state utility, we provide a sol solar home system for the solution. And the example that we already, the pilot project that we already done, we provide the sol solar home system with the capacity of 350 watt peak for one host for one home and it is just for lighting for tv and for ventilators and of course the policy of the government up to the year 2030 we have to provide access for 100 percent of the village and of the household access to electricity and regarding the energy transition by the study of the technical assistance from the ASEAN Development Bank, the picture of our power generation made by 2040, composition of the biggest is hydropower, solar powers, and LNG. But just to inform you that coal still play a, a role in the power generation mix. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jonah. I think now it's time that we have some interaction with the floor as well, um, and also the audiences online. Uh, so may I ask uh, uh, if uh, any hands uh, at the uh, conference site there, because I cannot see. So. Uh, yes, Dr. Lee, there is one yeah. question here. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, uh, very good morning, and I apologize. I think uh, we are stressed in lunch time, so I just straight forward to the question. Um, as uh, Dr. Pumpat ha has highlighted uh, some uh, energy transition and energy crisis toward the climate change, uh, supply shortage, and risk of uh, energy price. So uh, for the, ac actually I just introduced myself. My name is Pisat, I'm from EDC, state-owned power company and as you may aware that the Asian power utility now are facing the double trouble regarding to the energy transition and energy crisis. Um, as you uh, may be the same in Thailand or Vietnam or Singapore or as well in Cambodia, many uh, power utility like EGAT and EVN have uh, lost or debt uh, billions of US dollar for this uh, recent year and uh, you have also highlight to work with the Mr. Uh, Lee, uh, the, the moderator about the uh, solution. For example, you have raised about the demand side management uh, rooftop and other uh, subsidy. So uh, I just want to straight for the question for the power utility. So uh, what is the policy or strategy recommendation for the Asian power utility in this uh, current circumstance? Since the rising price or tariff is not an option for a solution. And I just want uh, to learn more experience from EGAP about the source of fund or alternative source of energy in term um, for the energy transition. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your kind questions on, on me. Uh, if I think that um, the recommendations that uh, uh, I can share with you for uh, uh, this question, because I think that you, you are right that we are now facing the same uh, situation. Uh, EGAT, EVN, EDL or EDC has facing a lot of uh, 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 tremendous uh, uh, burdens at this time. Because uh, I think on one hand, uh, we have to taking care of the peoples uh, in the countries because electricity 
is something that uh, uh, mandatory and necessary for for all the people in 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 the country. But on the other hand, we have to make sure that uh, how can we uh, ensure the uh, sustainable business uh, that you have to 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 uh, to do the business, even though you are the public utilities. But you have to make sure uh, how can this business can be survived. Uh, my my recommendations, uh, uh, if I can go straight forward, uh, uh, the the first thing I think that uh, in terms of the um, uh, the cost of the fuel that you use for for your electric cities, this is the 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 key things that can ensure that you can lower the cost of your electric city uh, production generation. Um, in Thailand, we rely a lot on our natural gas. This is our experience, and so uh, but on some house we are still uh, a little bit lucky that we have our own uh, indigenous resource of the gas from the Gulf of Thailand. I think that is around uh, 60%. But another 30% we have uh, to import from outside. So when, when the cost of the uh, uh, gas swing from time to time, that affect a lot on our electricity price. And uh, on our side, we have to ensure that the public utilities have to work closely with the um, uh, the companies or the the oil and gas companies who can uh, bring the oil and gas to the country at the reasonable price. This is the key things that that I would recommend. Uh, the second thing is that when we talk about the um, the price of the electricity that will go to the households. Um, we cannot ensure the low cost for lifetime, but we must have to address these issues to the people uh, gradually and let them understand that this is the crisis. This is not the normal situation. And they have not be able to uh, behave like what they did before. So they need to adjust. So I think the key thing is that even though the government still subsidized uh, some uh, electricity or, or some types of the fuels in, in the program, but they have to ensure that inform the people in advance that how long this uh, subsidy program will, will be last for. Otherwise, it will uh, end up with an unlimited subsidy and that will incur a lot of debt burden to the government. So I think this is the, the, the second recommendation. And the third thing that I think that uh, we need to ensure that we announce the public campaign to, uh, to stimulate the energy saving uh, uh, at this time across the countries. Otherwise, uh, I think that the behavior uh, uh, as normal will not be survived uh, uh, at, at this point in time. So I think we can show these uh, uh, examples to our people like uh, what they did in the European countries. They have to turn off the light, they have to turn off the heater, they have to uh, change the time to open and close the, the gas stations. This kind of thing you have to inform the public uh, uh, immediately and then hope that they can get the awareness from, from the people and then they will make some change from, from their own. This is my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Plumpat. I strongly agree with uh, you on the role of the uh, public uh, on this, uh, uh, even it's, if it's government-led uh, energy programs uh, on the cost side and also on the energy saving side. Now, I think we are already running late on the schedule. So um, I, I uh, frankly speaking, still have many questions remaining here. Uh, I hope that there will be other opportunities that I will be able to uh, physically be there and uh, uh, learn more from uh, all of you. Uh, but I think uh, it's already time. So let's, uh, for now, close this session uh, so that everybody can go for enjoyable lunch and uh, we will somewhere 
uh, again, I, I believe, uh, continue this uh, brilliant discussion. So uh, may I ask the, uh, everyone to join me for a round of applause for our excellent speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>